Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today we continue with the Shadow Tech Goddess Part 3, Chapter 2, The Waiting Colossus. So, I'm a bit tardy. I usually try to pump out one reading every week, but no readings last week because I was on vacation in South Carolina. Had a lot of fun, saw a lot of things, learned a few items, but wow, it was hot as fuck! It was plus 94 degrees every day with at least 80% humidity. We're walking 20,000 steps a day on average. Yeah. Yeah, I was taking a bath in my clothes. My underwear was drenched. My shoes were drenched. Everything. But still, it was fun to get out with the wife and, and have some fun. But I'm back now and we can continue with the story as... Normal. Last week, Paymaster Stenstrom and Lady Gwendolyn found themselves under attack by the dastardly forces of Hannah Ben Sherlamp and her George Parr servants. She gave them general directions. They searched, found the Seeker, eventually caught up with it because a, a sprint ship is faster than a stray light warbird. Snuck into its blind spot in its rear and started shooting. And then Paymaster Stenstrom, still recovering from his bout of gift valve previously, finds himself unable to rouse himself from bed and go to the bridge and start commanding the ship he dreamt he did but nothing is coming out of his mouth, sort of like one of those nightmares where you can't talk. Boy, that is a, that is a nightmare, isn't it? <laughs> Whoa. Lord Aram, Lady Alesta appear in his dream, and using their road, spirit him away to a kind of unpleasant, drafty, dark world on a hilltop. He and Lady Gwendolyn, there they were, and he awakens from his dream, and, and there they are on this weird planet with this big-ass moon in the background. And as it turns out, that is... Ing. They, ha they are now on Ing. And it's kind of pressing. It's not quite what, at least what Lady Gwendolyn was thinking. She was thinking it would be more like Kana, but it's kind of dark and kind of windy. Although they were there probably at night, so it, it brightens up quite a bit. They take shelter. Next morning, they see this big moon off in the distance. Hasn't moved at all. And then they summarize that it's an, an an incredibly huge spherical object on the ground and that's where they're gonna make their way to let's proceed shall we where are we we are in page 271 and there are only 335 pages told in the book so we're well within 100 pages of being done got a lot of business to take care of so let's proceed right now for kind of a shorter chapter this is part three chapter two the welcoming colossus Continuing on, they covered a good 15 miles before retiring for the day. There was no cave for them to shelter in this time, so they made do against the leeward side of a steep hillock for protection against the wind. The coat was just large enough to admit him as well, and they snuggled together on the ground in the flickering light of the small fire Stenstrom had made, eating eel and the last of the berries they'd collected. Gwen pulled her arms out of the HRN sleeves and got her notes out again, taking more readings and compiling more data. Her bare arm with its gleaming watch poked out of the HRN with the mega eye hoisting it skyward. This is actually kind of nice. Peaceful and new things to discover. A few more days of data and we'll have a nice baseline detailing if the days are getting longer or shorter. I have no idea what season this might be. I hope we're not at the outset of winter. If that be the case, I'll never get my coat back. A few more notes and she got back inside the cozy nook of the HRN and began dreaming of dulciners and quiet evenings at home. She dreamed of Belmont Manor, though her ideal version of it wasn't what actually existed on the shores of Tyrol. He was certain she'd have changes she'd like to go over with him. Her thoughts always had just the two of them at the manor rolling around the vast hallways and sitting rooms alone. But he had to interject. Belmont Manor was never empty, with the staff and his army of 29 sisters always coming and going, and his father's occasional presence. His sister Lyra, still unmarried and in no particular hurry to change her status, lived there full time. One never knew who or how many of his sisters were going to be in attendance for dinner at his departed mother's grand table. And that's how he liked it. All of his sisters and their families were welcome at any time. Roughing it, 
under the fast-moving cloudy skies, they eventually drifted into sleep. Wake up! came a crawling voice. During the night, Gwen was startled awake, their minds hooked together. Stenstrom awoke as well. In the cloudy dark of the steppe, they saw a light on the horizon, low at first, but steadily rising and forming a strong, mist-clogged beam lancing through the clouds. A loud, chattering sound filled his ears. No, not his ears, his mind. The sound was deafening, growling with chaos. Gwen quickly closed up the walls of her mind, shutting herself and Stenstrom back in and forcing all else out. He stood. The voices came from the light in the distance. He produced his mega eye and trained it upwards. A ship prowled through the cloudy night sky. It had the fine lines and white paint of a league ship, long, thin, straight as a pencil, lit up in standard fleet running lights. It was a Sprint-class vessel, no doubt about it. It was the George Parr. Curiosity mixed with dread and cold terror filled them. Frustration, too, at this high-flying and inconvenient interloper wrecking the open-minded solitude they had enjoyed. How in creation did they get here? Stenstrom trained the ship in his mega-eye. As the ship rose into the southern sky, he saw a number of reddish scanning lights drift down like nets of irresistible energy and pan about the step in a long, sweeping arc, hauling in troves of data. Gwen pulled him down to her side and covered him with the long tails of the HRN. It's scanning for us, Bell. She sent to him in blaring surface chatter. The whole continent should be under their eye. They'll have us zeroed in seconds. Her years of experience came into his thoughts. The courses on the topic of scanning energy she'd taken at fleet. Memories of tracking a tiny field mouse across the heather from orbit. And the sheepish delight as she, just for fun, locked the guns onto it as it scurried through the brush. She didn't fire, of course. Now the two of them were like mice in the field, and the hand controlling the guns from high above might not be so kind. Stenstrom got out his mega eye again and hoisted it to his face. Port interior wing, along with its various packages of scanning instrumentality, is missing. Tara said they'd shot it off in their previous engagement, and she was correct. So their scanning energies aren't at full. Look how low they're flying. I think I see it trailing smoke. Even still, if they catch us in those lesser scanning cones, they'll zero us by our heat. She looked at the few flickering embers of their fire with horror. This fire will have us made, Bell. The optics on a sprint ship are without peer. She kicked at it, trying to douse the flames. Curls of smoke went up. The ship settled into a slow port turn, lazily orbiting. It's about 80 miles west. It seems to be just sitting there. As Stenstrom watched... Several tiny craft emerged from its bays. They've launched several suborbitals. They're coming down to the surface. He stood, seized Gwen about the waist, and tore off across the hilly landscape as fast as he could manage with his TK. The TK quickly tired him, but he couldn't stop. He had to get distance from their campsite, a lot of it. Otherwise, George Parr would zero them, open up and roast the both of them alive in a SAR beam. Flying low, the darkened ground whizzed by, the coattails of his HRN slapping against the grass. Part of him was glad that George Parr was here, on Ing, instead of harassing the Seeker. That meant Tara had time to get away to safety. His other half wondered if they were moments away from getting fried. They'd traveled several miles to the south and stopped on a bluff to get a better look at the ground party in the suborbitals. Gwen took control of the Mega Eye and zoomed in. I see a crew of six. They're hard at assembling some sort of emitter, possibly a comm station. I see the components for a portable comm, a shed, an antenna, and a type 6 thermal plant for power. They already have it online and they've set up a sentry post to guard it. As they crouched on the ground and watched, they saw what the George Parr crew was up to. Powered by the portable thermal plant, a colossal hologram punched its way into the night sky at least a mile high. As the hologram took shape and formed, Gwen's mouth dropped open. That utter bitch. 
A huge hologram of Professor Hannah Ben Sherlamp sprawled across the landscape, powdered arms held out in welcome, her wigged head splitting the clouds. She spoke in a vast, thundering cone. Welcome, friends, to the world of Eng, home of our ancient ancestors. I, Hannah Ben Sherlamp, E-V-O-R, and my team of hard-working experts have laboured long to rediscover this place of riches embedded deep in our collective history, and our work now belongs to the ages. I give you Aang. She even had a gigantic holographic representation of her Dragon Ball desk. Her hologram seated herself behind it and sat with practiced polish. We are to destroy that wretched thing, Gwen said. We can't, it's guarded. Best leave it be. The hologram spoke once again. Oh, and to Lord Belmont and Lady Prentice, I reiterate that you ought to have accepted me as your mentor and benefactor. Now, if you are indeed here on Eng, there shall be naught remaining of the pair of you but a few free molecules and trace gases. You have brought this fate upon yourselves. The hologram looked back in the direction of their camp. Scanning beams issue forth and panned about. Creation, Bell, they've zeroed our camp. Gwen's thoughts surged through his skull. The George Parr banked and proceeded to the area, its cone focused on a single spot, joining the hologram's cones in a dance hall craze of spotted light. Those are fleet crew on that ship. They wouldn't knowingly fire on two fleet personnel, Gwen thought. Even if Captain Duval revealed himself to be a capering madman and ordered them to do so anyways, the crew would surely mutiny. A moment later, there was a flash of night-searing garnet light and a great trembling shook the land. The George Parr was firing. The weight of deadly star beams came down from her forward ventral bays like the fist of God and devastated the area where they'd camped. They extended the shot in a long, hot blast, banked around, and then stagger-fired, carpeting the entire area in a tat-tat-tat of devastation. Professor Sherlamp's hologram looking on and passively. Then they began firing in different directions, trying to triangulate in on Gwen and Stenstrom's position. But the variables and the time since departure were too great, and their shots were bad misses. So you were thinking, Gwen? Answers your question, doesn't it? The SAR beams quieted and scanning cones filtered down again, panning about, assessing the damage done. Professor Sherlamp still sat at her hollow desk. The ship maneuvered over the destroyed area of their camp in an ever-widening series of concentric circles. Unlike the deafening gas compression engines of his seeker, the George Parr made almost no noise. It was wraith-like in the clouds. A lazy plume of blasted earth rose into the night air like an organic surrender flag. The hologram cleared her throat. Come on, we need to create some distance between us and them. Onward, he TK'd, gaining more and more speed, more and more distance, low, bouncing off the ground. Gwen huddled up inside the HRN. From far away, they heard a rolling, contented <laughs> laughing, tinged with a bit of wickedness floating by them on the wind. A small, chiding mental voice worked its way through Gwen's mental barriers. Joe boy, he heard. Joe boy, I'm back. I know you're down there somewhere, you fucking little bastard. Huh? We saw your campfire and thought we'd knock, but it seems you weren't home, were you, huh? We can't find your blasted, stinking remains anywhere. It was the Lacerda, yet again. She stopped and waited, perhaps hoping for a response of some kind. Then she continued, So much better! 
I'd rather it be you and me alone on this wretched planet where we can settle this up in person and nobody's gonna interfere, hmm? Huh? I really hope that fucking bitch is down there with you too. You know the one I mean. The one who gave me the little brain scramble last time, huh? Oh, what I'm gonna do to her. <laughs> Had me in the tank, she did. And I still can't hear out of my left ear. I'm gonna show her what her fucking guts look like. <laughs> huh? What do you think about that? There was another pause. Bet you're wondering how we found you, huh? Huh? Suffice it to say, it wasn't all that hard. Professor Sherlamp pointed us in the right general direction. Duvall's associates helped out after they took apart that miserable slut from Caroline. And your hospitaller had all sorts of information, too. Oh, I'm sorry. You thought she'd off ship, didn't you, huh? Hmm? He was alarmed and crashed into the ground in a tumble. Gwen fell out of his grasp and rolled in the grass. Morgan. Morgan didn't get off to George Parr? But how? Tara told him she was off to Caroline and safe. Worry and dread filled him. So for starters, I'm gonna take your bitch, and I'm gonna rip her ear off and make her eat it. An ear for an ear. It's only fair, huh? Then you and me can finish up what we started on Caroline. It's gonna be a great fight. People would pay good money to watch a fight like that. And I'm looking forward to putting my hands all over you. Be seeing you around, Joe boy. Oh, by the way, take your garbage back. As Stenstrom watched, something small was jettisoned out of a ventral port of the ship and fell to the ground in a slow crumple. Have a nice night. <laughs> came to Lacerda's thoughts, then the George Parr bore away and disappeared in the direction of the giant shape far to the west. Professor Sherlamp's hologram sat at her desk, waiting to either greet newcomers from the League or rat out their position, whichever came first. Stenstrom went on for another few miles, finding a good place to set down and hide in a rotted out base of a fallen tree near a river. Though it was a little wet, the tree would mask their more obvious scannable signatures well enough for the time being. Gwen was exhausted. He settled her in for sleep, deep within the trunk. The process of its decomposition made its interior slightly warm, so she should be just fine. He took his HRN back and left, fading into the shadows and moving swiftly near the ground with TK. Though it was probably a trap, he headed back in the direction of their campsite, giving the professor's hologram a wide berth. He had to know what had been cast out of the ship, but he hoped he was wrong. When he arrived later, the area was raked and furrowed from the Sarbeam attack, like a shelled battlefield of churned earth. The hillock where they had camped was no more, flattened and scorched, reeved in smoke. Mixed in with the furrows were numerous sensing cubes known as warble bugs, deposited by the George Parr, hoping to lock on to him should he be dumb enough to return and take the bait the Lacerda had dangled in front of him. The cubes lay there, throwing out various beams of light and radiation, reading movement, temperature, chemical composition, and so forth. An alien fly buzzing across the field could trigger any number of scans, and the George Parr would have it zeroed in an instant. However, none of the cubes laying there could detect Stenstrom. His tire will fade into the shadows, being just that, a melded shift into a pocket dimension. He was there, moving through the destroyed landscape, but he wasn't there at the same time. From the west, the professor's hologram stirred and stood up, it turned its gaze in his direction, scanning cones saturating the area. After a minute or so, Sherlamp seemed satisfied that nobody was present and returned to her desk. The framed, holographic picture of her portly, teetotaler husband floated in midair behind her, just a little touch of home. 
In the middle of all this tumult was a huddled form laying in the dirt. He knew what it was without having to look. He knelt down beside Morgan Jetterix's corpse, gazing at her, the beautiful Halla face, that braided hair, her twisted, broken body encased in her hospitaller bodysuit. How he once dreamed of cutting her out of that bodysuit to get to the steaming flesh within. Lying in the dirt here and there were her hospitaller tools glinting in the mute light. What happened, Morgan? Why did you leave? He pleaded into her dead face and got no response. Covertly, he gathered up her tools, then bore Morgan away, escaping all notice. Morgan Jetterix, his friend, his midnight fantasy, and a woman he could have made his lover, was dead. When he thought it safe to do so, he stopped in a glen and made his final peace with her, cradling her small, firm body in his arms and whispering into her dead ears, How I could have loved you, Morgan. How I wanted to. I simply chose a different path. Then the recriminations came. What if he picked her over Gwen? Would she be alive even now? What would have happened to Gwen? Was this his fault? Was his status as some sort of planar entity the cause of this? The regrets, what it might have been like to have made love to her. If just once he had felt Gwen's death in the ruins of Caroline, and now he felt Morgan's, so much life, such a free spirit, and all that she would have given to him. Why would such a person offer a dull man from Tyrol her love? People are drawn to you, the Shadow Tech goddess had said. Gwen loved him, and Morgan loved him too. And he loved her in return, only in a different, less nurturing, more carnal way than he loved Gwen. He thought about Aram's disc in the conference room. He wished Morgan's name had been on it. He held her for a long while. He found a good green spot. He thought reminded him a bit of the Halla lands on Cana where Morgan had come from. He thought perhaps this spot might please her, might remind her of home, and he buried her in a grave dug with his own two hands, the sister's strength not failing him. Giving her a final kiss on the cheek, he covered her up with heavy stones and carved her a headstone with his marzible. Here lies Morgan Jetterix. Lady of Thompson, and Samaritan of the Grand Order of Hospitallers, a path not taken. He looked back one last time and said his final goodbyes. The pile of rocks he made sank down and settled a little. He didn't want to leave her there, but what choice did he have? Perhaps when the fleet came to rescue him and Gwen, they could exhume Morgan and take her back to Cana. He flew away at last on his TK, hearing her ghost calling out to him as he departed. I loved you too, Belle. His thoughts darkened as he covered the ground. Captain Duval, or the Lacerda, had killed Morgan in cold blood, and now were seeking their blood as well with the help of Professor Sherlamp and her gigantic hologram. Darkness entered his mind, and the desire for revenge took control of his soul. This place, this ing of old, was going to be a tomb, either for him or for them. He was going to find the George Parr and attack, and then he pit his strength against theirs. A foul-mouthed, wretched, debauched, strung-out, bald-out, cooked-up, murderous ex-sister and ex kadar Gamain. Both of them were the going to die. Whatever happened after that was irrelevant. He moved on in the direction of the massive monolith in the far distance. He figured that's where the George Parr was making birth. He passed a stream. From the air, he saw large fish swimming lazily through the water. Gwen would love those. Small matter. Before dawn, this would be settled one way or the other. Something knocked on his thoughts. Belle? Belle, where are you? It was Gwen. She was awake, searching for him. He thought of her alone and bewildered in the tree. He wondered what would happen to her. Should he fall, the Lacerda would surely get her too. He put his fury aside and calmed himself down. I'm here, Gwen, 
finally waking up. Where am I? It smells in here. You're in a rotten tree stump. A fine place for a countess, isn't it? Stay in there. It's warm and safe. Are you feeling hungry? I'm starved. I'll be back soon, and I'll have fish. Oh, that sounds delicious. Please hurry. I love you, Belle. I love you too, Gwen. He TK'd faster and made to get some of those fish he'd seen. He was hungry too. And with that, we conclude part three, chapter two, the welcoming Colossus. And as you see, the cover of the book features Professor Sherlamp's gigantic hologram. And a lot of people think when they, and rightly so, when you look at the cover, oh, that's got to be the Shadow Tick Goddess. But no, no, it's Professor Sherlamp trying, and quite successfully so, to take credit for discovering Aang. And you know that's got to be pissing Lady Gwendolyn off. George Parr arrives, starts scanning for them, starts shooting at where they think they are, which is odd considering it's a uh, full of fleet personnel who should not want to be party to such a thing. And then very sad, apparently Morgan Jetterix was still on the George Parr, and apparently they tortured and killed her, threw her out the ship, let her fall to the ground. Stenstrom found her, felt remorse at her loss, grieved for her, built her a a shallow grave and buried her with the thoughts that when they, the fleet comes to pick them back up, they can take Morgan home to the Hallowlands as well. Very sad. Next, and then, I, I didn't read it quite right, but then Stenstrom was determined just to find the George Parr and have it out with with them and, you know, go down in a blaze of glory. Take out the George Parr, take out the Lacerda, who's here, and finish the job one way or the other. But but then Gwen woke up and her thoughts soothed him and he decided to get some breakfast and head back to Gwen. Next chapter, part three, chapter three, The Tempest Vandal. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, we know who the Tempest Vandal is and what it wants. So, and apparently it's there on Ing as well, or it finds him on Ing. So we'll see how that goes. Probably not going to go well. And I want to thank my good friend, Cass Peace, for once again voicing Hannah Ben Sherlamp's lines. Very grand, very, uh, very booming and uh, commanding. Thank you, Cass, once again for your amazing read. Until then... This is Ren Presents. I'm your host, Ren. Peace out.